Today we have the opportunity to talk about the bosses, right? Because we've been talking about different aspects of getting engaged in a business. We've talked about how one would have an idea to run a business and whether it would be a good idea to run this through a corporate entity, the types of corporate entities you can have. We went through the process that one needs to go through in order to set up the company. We talked about what are your, what is your position if you're an owner as a shareholder in a private limited company and, you know, to an extent public ones as well and what that means. But today we're going to focus on what the bosses actually do. So the company is run by the board of directors. It sounds fancy. Does it sound fancy? I think it sounds very fancy. I'm a company director. Isn't that very impressive? So like, I am Diane Simon. I'm a company director. Oh, wow. Like you're a company. Is it a big company? Oh, yeah, it's huge. It's got like uh, one share of one pound. So we get to see what the board is actually doing. Somebody has to run the business because the business is, as we said, a legal fiction. So it's a wonderful thing to say that it benefits from separate corporate personality and it's got all these characteristics. But as we came across in previous presentations, something technically having this capacity doesn't mean that it can exercise it and can carry out actions in the real world. Maybe in the future, maybe AI reaches the point of automation that the companies can genuinely run themselves on the basis of a set of predetermined criteria. Um, there was this story in the press that there is a company that has created an AI bot that can actually engage in contractual negotiations, that it can discuss with the other party, be it human or another bot, reach common ground and then draft the terms of the contract and then agree everything and, you know, it can all do all this by itself. So if you had given your bot that is supposed to represent the company enough information about what the objectives are, then theoretically, at some point sooner or later, the bot will be able to take actions and run the company by itself. So then we're, go we're getting to a point that not only we have a virtual entity with, that is a legal person, but perhaps this legal virtual entity can interact by itself without needing human agency. We are not there yet, and remember that the law really trails very significantly technological development. So even if technically the bot could now negotiate and contract and do all of these things, the law still requires a human agent to be the representative of the company. So the, the reality of what is technically possible and the legal acceptance of that in, um, in this domain is going to take a while to come. So what we do know and what is still the case in the law, regardless of the evolution of AI, is that you need a human agent to carry actions on behalf of the corporation. Since you have a bunch of people involved in a corporation, who is it that actually gets to make those decisions? Of course, we're assuming here that more than one person is involved. Because in my case, if I am the sole shareholder and I am the director and the sole employee, then... I am carrying out all these roles simultaneously. So perhaps it's an artificial legal point to discuss when I made a decision about purchasing something or taking on some work, was I doing this in my capacity as director, in my capacity as shareholder, or my capacity as manager, as a paid employee? In effect, it does not really matter. It might matter when I come to extract value out of the company and pay myself how I'm, why and how I'm extracting that payment. But in terms of the actual decision making, if it's a one person company, these distinctions slightly are in the background. But if there are more people involved, say that we've got a major investor that is the majority shareholder and I am the director of the company and also the sort of primary, the primary agent for that company. I do most of the work. I've got 10% of the shares. I collect a salary, but 90% of the shares are held by a friend of mine who is my key investor. When a decision has to be made, we, the company needs to purchase a piece of equipment or we have a proposal for some project and we're thinking about how do we do this? Should we take on this project or not? If me and my colleagues sit down to discuss, 
it is not immediately obvious who is the key decision maker. From a practical point of view, and the law is fairly clear, but from a practical point of view, it might not be obvious to the people themselves who should be the key decision maker. Should it be the director or the employee who's going to carry out the task, or should it be the majority shareholder? If the other guy owns 90% of the shares, then you might think that his opinion is actually quite significant. The more people you have involved in a business and the more spread out this is, and the more distinct the ownership from the management, the higher the possibility that you might get into some sort of disagreement as to who does what. And shareholders are there to make money out of their investment. Shareholders in a big public company in the stock market, they've got a little bit of, uh, they've got a few shares. They don't really care about the management if they seek to make money out of selling these shares for a higher price than the price that they bought it. But in smaller companies, when the shareholding is pretty much fixed, somebody who's a majority shareholder might actually want to be involved. So they might get into a disagreement with the people at the board of directors as to what should be happening. Now, in law, who is the authorized representative? This came to the courts time and time again. So now it's got expression both in the Companies Act, but also in this kind of long uh, series of cases where the court needed to come up with an explanation or an interpretation of the rules and tell these distinct groups of people within the company who is the primary decision maker. The answer is the directors are the primary decision maker. And it is their capacity as directors that gives them that power. And it doesn't even matter if they've got shares or not. Because it's not obligatory for somebody who's a company director to also be a shareholder. The law says that since the company is an artificial entity and it requires the intervention of a human agent to do things, this human agent is the board of directors. So today we're talking about the sort of lines of responsibility and, the, and how management is structured. But what we're going to see in the, in the coming uh, presentations is how uh, the law implies a long series of obligations on the people who carry out that stuff. Now, in practice, you will be consulting. If you are a director or you're in the board of directors, you will be consulting with the shareholders. Because if you've got people with significant shareholding, their views obviously matter and it is their company. So it makes sense that you have them on board when you're trying to get these things done. But the way that the law is structured that says the board of directors is responsible for running the business, it means that you can ignore interference. So if they want to disrupt what you're doing or they want to have influence on day-to-day -day operations outside the boundaries set by law, then the board of directors does not have to listen to the shareholders. But it is always a fine balance between deciding what's going on. The articles of association are the primary tool to inform everybody within the company as to what are these lines of responsibility and what people are supposed to do. So if you look at the model articles, as we said, the model articles are the ones that the law gives you as a template that if you're setting up a company, you can adopt them either into their entirety or you can have some amendments if you wish. But the model articles as a sort of baseline of the constitutional information for the company. If you look at what it says about director's general authority in the model articles, it does say that the board of, re the board of directors is responsible for running the show. And the shareholders do have some power, but they have, first of all, the background power. So if the board of directors is unavailable or is unable to reach a decision because they're not there to meet, because they're sick, because they're incapacitated in some way, or they're so deadlocked that they're really fighting with each other within the board and they cannot make a decision, this decision can then fall back to the general meeting. So if there's an absence of government for the company, then the general meeting can assume that role while that problem is in place. But other than this, the general meeting has the ability to intervene for certain decisions. 
And to be fair, certain things are so important that you need to consult a general meeting before you go ahead. If, if there's a list of them I'm going to show you in a moment. But if you wanted to kind of shut down the company, purely this is not a decision that the board can make by itself. But the shareholders have this residual power and they get to decide crucial issues already predetermined in the law, but they don't get to intervene whenever they feel like it for whatever reason they feel it. Now, having said that, the board of directors is able to delegate to professional managers. The more complex the company gets, the more you need the assistance of other people. So if I'm by myself, if it's a one-person company, this is not an issue. I'm by myself, I'm, I'm carrying out all these roles simultaneously. If there are a few of us together involved in this company, some of us are in the board of directors, some of us are shareholders, uh, maybe the directors are also shareholders, but there is a small community. There is a sort of expectation that pretty much everybody is involved in some capacity. And if we're talking about a few directors in a small company, they're probably all actively involved and they probably don't have the money to hire a lot of additional people for help. It's not like you set up a company and the fact that you set it up immediately generates money and you think, okay, I'm going to hire somebody to do this and I'm going to go sit by the beach somewhere, right? That's not how it works. But if you have a bigger company, you begin to have more complex organizational structures. Not everybody who works in management is going to be in the board of directors. The university, for instance, has a very complex uh, management structure. The people who sit on the board of governance are like a handful of people. So that would be the equivalent of the board of directors. There are a few people that are there to carry out these uh, functions determined by law. But the day-to-day -day management falls down to various people that have specific appointed roles. It falls down to the faculties that have got their deans and then a set of uh, roles. Other management tasks fall down to the schools and so on and so forth. So there's like a complex organizational structure where everybody does something. Not everybody who has management capabilities will be a director. And this is present in the model articles of association that they say it is perfectly possible that the board of directors delegates some of its authority to professional managers that are, they will be employees and they're hired to do this job specifically. Now, having said that, the directors themselves are not necessarily employees of the company. So being a director is holding an office, is an official function. It doesn't mean that you also have to be an employee. Now, very often, the people who are directors in more complex structures, they will also have an employment contract. That's why you, you hear about somebody leaving, resigning their position from the board, and then leaving with a significant payment because also their contract of employment has been terminated, and then there are provisions in that, and they get some money on the way out. No, and you cannot put, you cannot actually put employment provisions in the Articles of Association. The Articles of Association will tell you, we have a management structure, we have directors, and the directors have then the capacity to delegate uh, their authority to professional managers. But then what happens in the appointment and the remuneration of these professional managers is something that comes further down the line, and it will have to do with people's individual employment contracts. Is it a good idea to be an employee of the company if you're also a director? This is, I think, a significant question. The baseline position is that it is if the engagement with this company is a significant part of your livelihood or the main way in which you make a living, it is effectively your job, then it is a good idea to have an employment contract in addition to you having a position as a director. Now, when I set up my own company, this was one of the initial questions that I had. Am I allowed? I know that I'm allowed to represent the company because this is in the model articles of association that I've adopted. It's in the law all over the place that I know that I am the director. I am the board of directors because there's nobody else. Therefore, I am, you know, the way in which the company interacts with the outside world. 
But when it comes to carrying out substantive work, somebody hires my company to deliver a particular service. Am I allowed as the director to actually do this, being the company directly, or am I obligated to hire myself as an employee or with some sort of contract for services, right? So I can deliver that work. Now, interestingly, I, this question is not obvious from the documentation, even though it appears like a fairly legit question, I would, I would imagine. It's not, the answer is not obvious in the documentation. Chat GPT says you don't have to. All the information from HMRC is only about how do you extract money out and what happens when you try to get paid. Business support offices, uh, there are various things that the government has set up, hotlines and so on, to help with entrepreneurship. They didn't even understand the question when I called them. Now, the conclusion is that if you are a director, you can work directly for the company. So you don't need to kind of separate yourself at that moment to say, I'm a distinct employee that has been set, set to you to carry out some work. For, for that contract, for the delivery of the contract, the delivery of the service, you are the company when you turn up at the face. So that part is fine. So a director is entitled as a representative of the company to actually carry out work on behalf of the company. It might be a good idea to have a contract of employment if this is your livelihood because it will help you extract money of, out of the company because everybody is obsessed about this. If you go and look at the discussion forum, what people are talking about in relation to company formation and company operation, it's filled with contractors, you know, from kind of people that offer professional services like accountants or whatever, or, you know, the plumber, the electrician, they're all obsessed with how do they handle the money and the payments and how do they actually extract the money out of the company for themselves so they can pay their, their rent. On that level, you cannot just, as we've said pre multiple times in the past, you cannot just pick up the company's money and go pay your bills. So you need to somehow extract the money from the company. And there are two ways to do this. Either you get dividend payments, but this only can happen once or twice a year. Or if you want regular income, then you need to hire yourself as an employee. There's no other option. Because if the company is paying you expenses, the ex it could pay you expenses as a contractor, but expenses are only expenses you carry out your work. Expenses are not your rent, like your Netflix or you know, your school fees or whatever. Right? It can only be money that you spent to go deliver the work or you know, equipment that you needed to buy or whatever. So relying on expenses isn't a great idea. Everybody gets expenses. So if you're a director, even though you're not an employee, if you have expenditure in carrying out your, your director's duties, then you can submit the receipts and you'll be reimbursed by the company. Fine. And that's kind of tax free for you because it's expenses. But if you want to have a regular income or you want to be able to get money out frequently, then you really have to hire yourself as an employee. And as we've seen when we were talking about the consequences of limited liability, if something goes wrong somehow, then you probably need to have the distinct employment contract. It might have to do with issues of liability, it might have to do with insurance, coverage, and all of that stuff. So the best practice advice is that if you're regularly working for the company, this is your main activity, and you want to regularly extract money out of this for your life, be able to live, then you should hire yourself as an employee. Can you do repeat uh, contracts for services, meaning that you're not an employee long term, but you do like one-off contracts when, when you need to carry out some work on behalf of the company? Uh, HMRC advises against this because they think this is an attempt to uh, avoid paying national insurance contribution. Because if you're an employee and you're on payee, which is, you know, pay as you go, employment that's set up by your employer, then you pay national insurance contributions and your employer pays national insurance contributions. And they also, they're obligated to enroll you in a pension fund above a certain level of pay. If you're doing things as a contractor on a contract for services, none of this applies. But effectively, you're cheating HMRC out of national insurance contributions and you're cheating yourself out of um, 
uh, it pulls full pensions at that. Right. So HMSC says, don't do it this way. And in any event, if you were doing this regularly and you were having kind of repeat uh, contracts for services where you have to carry out the work, then you've breached the rules on contractors, which is the IR certified and some of the other stuff. So you can get in trouble for effectively tax abating. Now, the result of this question is, if you are a director, what is your money relationship with the business? Well, you don't have to be an employee. But if you seek to extract money for doing work, then you need to be an employee. If you're a director and also a shareholder, then you can get some benefit in terms of dividend payments once or twice a year. But the reg if it's your regular job, if it's your regular engagement, then you should be um, hired as an employee. So to come back to the point where I started, why do we have all these people that are kind of senior board members and then they say they're leaving and then you read in the press that they get like a 10 million pound payout? It's not because they're directors and they're entitled to money. It's because in addition to being directors, they were employed to be senior managers and in the contract of employment, employment there are terms and conditions that say, if we terminate your quota of employment, then this, this compensation is built in. Now, not everybody's contract has compensation provisions for termination. Any of you have jobs, part-time jobs or anything like this? I don't think your contract has any compensation provisions. You, you will only gonna get statutory redundancy pay, which kicks in only if you've been in employment for more than three years, I think. Um, so it doesn't really, it definitely doesn't work for the, if you're there for a year or less. And statutory redundancy pay is peanuts. I think you get like a week's pay for every year that you've been there. There's like nothing. No, it's not like the movies where you're getting, oh, I got fired and I can live for a few months. In, in the continent, a redundancy pay is actually quite generous. So they're supposed to give you like a, a good percentage of the salary you were actually making for like a prolonged period of time. When they fire, and they're not, I'm not saying firing you for cause, so like you did something wrong. If they decide, well, we don't need you anymore, you know, off you go. There are provisions for redundancy pay to allow you to live because they kicked you out and you didn't expect to be kicked out and you need to be able to live and you find another job, right? Now, in this country, we don't really care about people surviving, so there's very little in terms of uh, redundancy pay. Unless it is built into a contract. Did you guys hear the story about uh, uh, Nigel Farage and uh, the, the argument that he had with the bank and all that? What happened with this guy is that he was a customer of Kutz, which is the kind of rich people bank owned by NatWest. For some bizarre reason, this doesn't happen very often, but they said they kicked him out as a client. So this is a known person. I mean, he's a, he's a celebrity. In any case, it's a known person and, you know, there's a perception that he's got money. So that's why she wasn't that private banking institution. So they say they kick him out because they uh, object to his attitude, his beliefs that they don't correspond to the values of the bank and so on. Which is fair enough, by the way. You are not obligated to do business with everybody. You can choose who you do business with. In the same way that if, you know, somebody comes around and says, Yanis, would you like to make a video for us? And I'm like, no, because I don't like you guys because you suck. That's my right. Now, what you're not allowed to do is discriminate on the basis of protected characteristics. So if I tell somebody, uh, no, I cannot, I'm not going to contact with you because you're a woman or because you're a person of color or, or something like this, that's, or, you know, because you're uh, gay or whatever, these are protected characteristics. So making decisions as to who you do business with in all the basis of protected characteristics is unlawful discrimination. Uh, he works in employment, he works in contracting, he works in the biotech. But outside this, it is freedom of contract. Nobody obliges you to do business with people you don't like. 
So you could kick somebody out of your store. If they're not behaving properly, or you don't, you object to them and you, you don't want to do business with them, then it's perfectly fine. So when the bank said, we are no longer going to offer an account to this guy because we object to him and he, his views and his behavior is not in accordance with our standards, that's fine. What is not fine is that the CEO of NatWest went and apparently talked about his business affairs with the German. And the highlight obligation that the bank has to the customer is confidentiality. So the bank, anybody, by law, has two core duties. One is to respect your instructions as to how the account is run. And secondly, to keep everything confidential. So the bank is not allowed to say, well, you set up a direct debit for a new mobile phone plan, so you could get the new iPhone. Maybe you don't need the new iPhone. So, you know, you're a student and so on. Maybe you should eat rather than paying for the new iPhone. So we're not going to own all this. They're not entitled to do this. They're obligated by law to respect your instructions. If you got the money in the bank, it's none of their business what you spend it on. And equally, they're not allowed to call your mom and go, you know what she got now? Guess what she got? She got the new iPhone. So that is a, a, a highlight breach of their obligations. So when the lady or that was uh, top of the parent uh, company, which is in this case NatWest, uh, revealed information about these guys' accounts. I'm thinking, uh, I think she said something like, we don't like him, but also, you know, this guy doesn't have enough money to belong in that bank. Right. She breached the law. He complained about it immediately. Of course you would, because this guy lives out of controversy. So anything that is kind of remotely interesting about him, he would make a big hoo-ha, which proves that even people in high positions that are paid a lot of money into stupid things. This was a very stupid thing to do. And it was predictable that we're going to get in trouble. Anyway. The lady says, okay, fine, this was and cool. It became very controversial in the press. The board says, we got to pretend to, to do something about this. So we're going to have to let you go. And she goes, okay, fine, I'm fired. Boo. 10 million which was the provision in, uh, in the contract. So that's why you've got somebody who is in a board position, in a senior management position, that leaves and then gets a big payout out of the company because it's not a function of company law, it is part of the terms and conditions of the company. Now, of course, what happened subsequently is that they said when that became controversial, uh, the, the the rest of the board said, hang on, we're firing you for cause, like because you broke the law. We're not firing you because we don't like you. So if we're firing you for cause, we don't have to pay you the 10 million because this was, if we fire you without you having done something wrong, right? But if we're firing you for cause, then you don't get the, the exit bonds. Yeah. So whether you qualify for the criteria of an account, that's an objective issue. That's not the, that's not the problem. Uh, for instance, I've got an account that says I need to deposit an X amount of money uh, every month. It needs to pass through the account. And then I need to have a minimum of two direct debits paying out every month. Because this is meant to be my main current account. So the way they define main account is X amount of money circulated and two direct debits uh, going out. Now, this is very tricky these days because anything you sign on as a regular payment, you pay by PayPal, right? So nobody has direct debits in. But anyhow, if... I don't have any direct debits, then they're going to say, you don't meet the criteria for this account anymore. So either we're going to charge you to keep it open, or you just, you just don't qualify for this, I'm sorry, and we're going to move you to something else. When you guys graduate, you no longer qualify for a student account. So they will automatically transfer you to what they call the graduate. Right? It's that, it's fine. But this is between you and them. So the problem isn't, does he qualify, does he deserve to be in that banking product? The problem is, they breached the law by talking about it. And then she would have gone and complained, you know, like, ah, they're kicking me out of the bank for political reasons. But the job is to keep it shut. The job is to say, we've done what we've done according to the rules. If he has a problem, 
he can sue us about it. And then if it's in court, then the information can become, uh, can become part of the court submission as evidence. But yeah, remember this. If you know, your mom ever says they called me from the bank because they thought you were doing something suspicious, you got them because they're not allowed to talk to your mom about it. Yeah. And now because of data protection and privacy regulation more broadly, we cannot talk about anything to anybody unless we have the express permission of all of the student. That's why we cannot actually call your parents when you guys are in trouble. So we need express. So if, say, you're, you're experiencing some difficulty and I'm thinking, oh, you know, this person came here, they stressed to death, you know, then if we talk to them, mom, they would probably help. I'm not allowed to do this. That's why I can suggest the super efficient counseling services here at the uni. And that are going to send you long forms to fill in. Uh, but I cannot actually call your parents and say this kid's in trouble. Yeah. And there are people who actually complained about this because there are people who kind of, you know, attempted suicide or all of these things. And the parents then said the university knew. We never knew the family. If somebody had called us, we would have intervened and then we would have stopped this. The legal requirement is that you're not allowed to talk to anybody. So the overall conclusion for the directors is they are the bosses. They are responsible for day-to-day -day decision making. The fact that you're a director is enough. You do not need to have an additional capacity. You don't need to be shareholder on top. You don't need to be an employee. You don't need to be something else. The fact that you're a director is an official capacity. You should not accept to be in the boards of directors anywhere without having full appreciation of what this means, because it is something more burdensome than just a funky title. Because then you need to do stuff in relation to the authorities and the regulatory requirements, and if you don't fulfill those roles correctly, you can get in trouble. So this is when they, they frequently advertise positions, would you like to be a non-executive member, a non-executive board member? which means you don't actually carry out anything day to day, but you have an overseeing capacity and people are going, oh, this would look great on the CV. And I get to go there for three meetings a year and they compensate these meetings by 500 pounds every time. So it's a little bit of money and it looks good. No, it doesn't. Because then if they do something stupid and they get in trouble, you're on the hook as well because you're also direct. It is possible that the board has failed to carry out its functions effectively. Therefore, collectively they're in breach, but most of the time it's individuals who have done something wrong. For instance, if they fail to do their annual returns to company house, so the company hasn't actually filled out the obligatory paperwork, they are all collectively in trouble. But if a director takes some money out of the till and goes and spends it on a holiday, then it's the person who has done it that gets in trouble because that's the person engaging in the violation. So when we talk about director's duties and what this means in practice, we're going to have some examples of that. So they're the bosses, they run the show, they do the day-to-day -day stuff. We said that the general meeting does have a background role to step in when the board is unavailable or just got into such a fight that they cannot decide about anything. But there are some areas where the general meeting will always have to be consulted. For instance, you cannot change the articles of association <coughs> by the board making a decision to change the articles of association. This is one of the areas that are reserved for the general meeting. And we said that if you want to change the articles, you need an enhanced majority. So, you know, more than half is not enough. You need three quarters of the vote then you can put something new in the articles of association. Also, if you want to change the type of incorporation, the directors cannot choose to take the com a company that is private and make it public, and then they are floating in the stock market. They cannot do this by themselves. They need to have the consent of the general meeting, and equally, they cannot shut it down. The directors cannot take the decision, well, this company is not working very well anymore, we will fill in the paperwork to wind it up, which is how you close it down, and not ask the owners of the business. 
you cannot issue additional shares without having the existing shareholders okay this. You cannot reduce the number of shares again. So, and also you cannot change the rights attached to those shares. I mean, of course, all of these things would require a change in the articles of association. So you kind of get the idea that the general meeting needs to be consulted. But these are highlight areas, general issues that have to do with the governance of a corporation that you need to have the okay of the general meeting. There are some additional things that have to do with corporate governance. Now, corporate governance is this kind of blanket terms that covers everything about how corporations are run. And there's a lot of literature about how to run corporations effectively. So when we're talking about corporate governance, we're usually talking about good corporate governance, kind of best practice requirements, how to do things well. So if the company is of a certain size and above that you need to have auditors appointed to look at your accounts every year, then the general meeting is involved in the appointments of auditors. Of course, it is involved in approving certain things that the directors might do. So if there's something that represents a conflict of interest, the director is somehow involved with the company. The director makes a loan to the company or is receiving a loan from the company or is selling some of their property to the company, or the other way around, is purchasing something from the company. All of these raise a conflict of interest concern. So the general meeting needs to say that this is okay before the transaction goes through. Or if the transaction has already happened, then the general meeting needs to approve a transaction that has already happened for it to be okay. And sometimes if we're talking about public corporations where somebody tries to take over, like they try to purchase shares and not take over the management of the business, um, certain things that the company can do to resist this, they need general meeting approval. Clearly, if you want to join the stock market or if you want to do certain operations in the stock market, you also need to have the approval of the general meeting. It's a fixed set of areas where the general meeting gets to intervene. Is the message from this that you can piss off the shareholders at no cost when you're asking, when you want to do stuff that don't fall within these defined categories? It's never a good idea to piss off the majority of your shareholders. And the reason why it's not is that the shareholders will always have the ability to do nasty stuff to you because they have an ultimate immense power, which is to fire you. The shareholders can, on an ordinary resolution, which means a simple majority, so as long as half of them want to do it, then it's fine. On an ordinary majority, they will always have the capacity to remove a director from office. So you need to remember this because it's something that comes up quite regularly. This is in section 168 of the company. Section 168 say that a company may by ordinary resolution at a meeting remove a director before the expiration of their period of office. So it doesn't matter how long ago they got appointed. If the general meeting loses confidence in a director, they can get rid of it. You cannot change this. There are certain provisions in the Companies Act that are default, which means this is what happens unless the members wanted something different. There are some provisions that are mandatory. The mandatory provisions, you cannot change. It is done in a certain way because the law requires it, regardless of what the members want to do. Section 168 is one of these provisions that are mandatory. So you cannot actually change the articles of association to say it is not possible to dismiss a director or we want to have a director for life or whatever, right? It is set by law at the ordinary resolution meeting and that's the end of it. So that is the reason why pissing off the majority of the shareholders will never work well. Because once they are sufficiently angry at you, they're just going to dismiss you. 
Now, if they want to exercise their right they've got in section 168, what can you do if, uh, if you're a director? You can make, you can, you are allowed to make representations to the general meeting to explain your behavior or explain your business plan or explain what you wanted to do. And you're entitled to kind of put this forward, but you cannot resist a vote to dismiss you. Even though you have an opportunity to speak and to explain, they don't have to change their minds. If they still come back and say, we just don't like you anymore, there's nothing you can do about it. Remember that this isn't employed. This is your position as a director. So the reason why they want to dismiss you doesn't matter. You, they, even if they say we don't like you because of something that would be a protected characteristic in terms of employment, right? this is not going to save you from your position as a director. If they wish to terminate your employment contracts, and then they do it in something that is protected, then that might constitute unlawful discrimination, and you might take them to an employment tribunal. But try and keep in your head the two things differently. Your position as a director is entirely dependent on the general meeting wanting to keep you on. Your position as an employee is protected by general employment legislation. So then there's an external constraint in what they are and what they're not allowed to do. And if there are sort of terms and conditions in your employment contract that give you a sort of payment if they want a dismission before the end of your terms, then you will be entitled to this from a contractual point of view. So you cannot, you're not going to win anything by pissing off the majority of your shareholders. Interestingly, um, there are a lot of people whose job is to agitate the shareholders to get rid of the board. But normally your entitlements as a shareholder are not affected by your participation in the company in other capacities. But it could be that there's a, there's a provision in the terms and conditions of your employment contract that require you to liquidate any shares that you have when you need it. And look, it depends, because if we're thinking about uh, major, major companies, public listed corporations, if we're talking about kind of executive street people, so, you know, like the top people in the, in the business, they usually have a very significant numbers of shares because a significant part of their compensation is in shares. If you had the requirement that they divest when they're, when they're selling, if this could dump a large number of shares into the market, so it might decrease the value of the shares. So you don't, yeah, so that's probably not a great idea. So maybe in, in smaller corporations, if it's not listed, it doesn't matter. Uh, for listed corporations, maybe there is some sort of plan to divest the shares, or you would want to do this if you're leaving the corporation, but if we're talking about big chunks, it will affect the value of the share and the perception of the company. So it would really be counterproductive to, to tell people you need to sell everything the moment you're out. Yeah. Um, now, a lot of people make it, make it their business to identify companies that are not managed effectively and to then obtain enough shares to entitle them to speak at the general meeting. And then at the general meeting, they propose a change of the board of directors. And they say, we have identified a bunch of problems. We think that the current management team is not doing a good job. We propose a new management team. These are our people. So if you vote to dismiss these guys, and then you appoint our team, this is going to be better for the corporation. And very often this is successful. Of course, this happens in environments where the company is quite distressed already. And the people make money out of this because when the company does better, obviously their shares increase, so then they can sell the share holding that they attained at a higher price, so then everybody pays. And usually they do it in association with other people, the people who become the executive team also benefit. So they, these usually are called activist investors, not in the sense that you know they're, 
they're pursuing a cause that is external to the profit making of the company, but there are people who are actually going to agitate the general meeting in order to both make money for themselves, but also to kind of uh, accelerate the, the evolution of the company and kind of change course in the company so the company becomes more successful in itself. So there are quite a few people that have made entire careers doing precisely this, identifying companies in, in trouble, getting a foothold, getting in, changing the management, um, and, and taking it in a, in a different direction from the it's a good It's a good business. It's usually funded fairly well because there are a lot of kind of money that goes into these things because it, if this is done properly, it can become quite successful. So we talked about contracts of employment and we talked about somebody having done a bad job as a director and or at least displeasing the general meeting, right, and getting kicked off. And we talked about the employment law implications of this. What are the company law implications of having done a terrible job? Because, okay, they dismiss you from your position. That's one thing. They, um, you might lose your employment contract, especially if they fire you for cause and you might not be getting any compensation for this. But is there anything from a company law point of view that might happen to you? Well, there is because the Secretary of State has the capacity to disqualify people from becoming directors again in the future if they have done something terrible. So this is in the Director's Disqualification Act. It's one of the things that you need to know in relation to this. And the and directors can be disqualified in three circumstances. If they've committed a very serious offense, usually contains some sort of dishonesty. If they've been uh, engaged in fraudulent or wrongful trading, these have technical definitions that we're going to see when we talk about insolvency. And where they, when they fail to comply with various formalities when the business is shutting down, because this has very negative consequences for the creditors and so on. So if you have done a terrible job, not only to the point that they kicked you off the board and, you know, they terminated your employment, but you've actually done a terrible job that shows not only that you've been harmful to the company you were directing now, but you're also a potential danger to other companies in the future, then the Secretary of State might pursue this capacity to disqualify you. You don't get disqualified forever. You get disqualified for a certain period of years, depending on the gravity of how badly you've carried yourself. This will be part of your record, so it will show in company's house next to your name that you've been disqualified you will not be able to become a company director again for the period that you've been disqualified. So if you're doing business with somebody and you find you kind of Google them and you find this information and you discover that they've been disqualified for running a corporation, maybe you should think twice before doing business with them because they have, uh, in all likelihood, done something very, very, very seriously wrong. Now, clearly somebody who has done that poorly um, probably had to contribute some of their own funds to cover credit or uh, demands uh, when the company shut down. But we'll get to that when we talk about insolvency. Breach of commercial morality, recklessness and incompetence at the spectacular level, serious offenses, failure to report appropriately, uh, they've been declared bankrupt on the personal level. So this is these are kind of highlight big time stuff. Is not simply doing a terrible job because they have perhaps behaved uh, poorly. So they didn't manage to turn around a corporation that was getting in trouble. But to an extent, this is life. It could be that they did whatever they could, but the market conditions were such that you know this business model doesn't work anymore. In the same way that, you know, if you if look at this. If you've got a machine that creates tape recorders that use physical tape, no matter how good you are in making tape recorders, there's simply no market for this anymore. So you may shut down. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think these guys have done a terrific job, to be honest, but it doesn't mean that they should be disqualified from being directors in other companies in the future. Disqualification means that you've done things wrong in a very, very severe level within a closed category of things that are considered that severe. Now, Robert Maxwell was an example because Maxwell was the owner of the, the Sun a group of newspapers uh, back in the 80s. 
the business wasn't doing terrifically well. He started taking money out of the pension fund to pay current liabilities of the business. And in the end, bankrupted both the business and the pension fund. And this was, this is used in the literature as, a, as an excellent example of horrible leadership and poor corporate governance in the sense that the majority of what was going on in there was determined by a single person. So there were no checks and balances. There was no independent board. There was no adequate communication with the shareholders. Everything was managed by one person who were pursuing their own personal agenda. And it all fell apart. So he died. If he hadn't died, he would have ended up in prison and then disqualified for a long period of time because he hit all these things that would lead you to do a disqualification. 